and convene us. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to people in the audience as well as people who are joining us online. Uh, for those who I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. Uh, welcome to our Public Health Forum. Public Health Forum is our monthly premier academic event of our uh, academic year where we invite thought leaders from around the world to talk about issues of consequence. Uh, today's Public Health Forum features Dr. Gibbons, who I'll introduce in a second, and is in partnership with the School of Medicine with thanks to Dean Entman, who is here with us. Uh, before I talk about the uh, speaker and the event, I just want to make a comment about our, um, one of the programs that we're particularly proud of as a school, that every year in uh, one of our public health fora, we mark and celebrate the program. This is our Community Scholars Program. Our Community Scholars Program was started in 2000 at the school, launched by my predecessor, Dean Bob Meenan. And it's really a program to take experienced public health professionals and create an opportunity for them to get an MPH while continuing their work. We do a fairly competitive um, selective application process and we really attract the best of the best. We always see the Community Scholars Program as a program that benefits everybody. It benefits the students because they can actually continue working. It benefits the agencies because they have excellent employees who then go on to get an MPH. And we think it benefits us because it gives us in our community excellent students who are part of the real world. The program has been around now for 19 years. We have supported 170 scholars and there are 11 of them who are currently doing their NPH degree. Four are with us today, a couple are in the front, a couple are in the, in the audience, and um, we simply wanted to acknowledge our community scholars and to say thank you for being part of our community. It's really a delight to have you, so thank you. <laughs> now, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gary Gibbons. Um, um, you know, we all, we all know that we do a lot of work with National Institutes of Health and with many directors of National Institutes of Health. Now, as a dean, I probably shouldn't say this, but you know, while all directors are equal, some directors are more equal than others, and Dr. Gibbons is my favorite director of any institute in the National Institutes of Health. Um, uh, he's <laughs> it's true, actually, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with apologies to other directors who I know well. Uh, so Dr. Gibbons, <laughs> I keep forgetting that this is on tape. Um, uh, it's just joking, um, uh, is director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of NASH, NIH. Uh, he oversees the third largest institute in NIH, budget of about 3 billion people and a staff of more than 2,000 people. NHLBI provides uh, leadership on research, training, and education on the prevention and treatment of heart, lung, and blood diseases. Since being named director of NHLBI, Dr. Gibbons has really advanced the Institute's investment in fundamental discovery science, as well as in efforts to advance uh, early stage investigators, expanding pay lines and creating a number of programs to really have benefited early stage investigators, which I think is truly laudable. Um, um, in terms of Dr. Gibbons himself, he has degrees from Princeton and Harvard Medical School. He spent some time in Boston, did residency in cardiology here at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then in his career, he was faculty at Stanford, then back to Harvard Medical School, and then Morehouse School of Medicine, where he was the founding director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute and chair of physiology and professor of physiology. He was on the NHLBI Council from 2009 to 2012, and he's now in his sixth year as director of the NHLBI. Dr. Gibbons, through his storied career, has received really like all the right honors, including election to the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Science. He was an RWJ Minority Faculty Development Awardee, uh, selected as a Pew Foundation Biomedical Scholar, and recognized as an established investigator of the American Heart Association. And on top of all that, I've had the great privilege of uh, speaking um, alongside Dr. Gibbons um, a couple of times. He is um, an engaging, interesting uh, scholar with um, really, I think, innovative ideas about uh, the fields in which he's, uh, he's involved with. And he's truly also a very pleasant and nice person. Dr. Gibbons. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for those uh, very generous words. And I'll, I'll try to, you know, whatever is said at BU stays at BU. Uh, I won't rat you out amongst my colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and appreciate uh, uh, this opportunity to visit. Um, part of what I just want to share with you is a different sort of talk uh, as a NHLBI director, uh, where I hope it's, it's been more of a, a dialogue and I've enjoyed uh, engaging you uh, this afternoon. It's an opportunity for me to, to get on the front lines and, and hear uh, from you uh, what you see as uh, some of the exciting opportunities and, and challenges we face together. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll invite you in uh, in this collective effort uh, we're engaged in. Because uh, this is a, a, a position of public service where I work for you in the public interest. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to get feedback on, on how we're doing. 
And so it's really in the spirit of what we call accountable stewardship, but we'll outline some things. Uh, I thought for this particular talk, I'd, I'd highlight uh, an area of passion around addressing health disparities that I think may uh, resonate uh, with uh, this particular uh, audience, uh, and then uh, how we might uh, seize some opportunities that are particularly ripe. Uh, in taking on this position for the last uh, several years, uh, I was drawn to uh, this position because of the mission to turn discovery science uh, into the health of the nation uh, in a way that really elevates all communities uh, in our nation. Uh, and to do that, um, we've tried to carry on a, a certain set of enduring principles uh, that we've tried to pursue over the last uh, five years of, uh, in part, uh, really uh, investing in you. Uh, the investigator initiated uh, discovery science and, uh, and that's what's been a driver of those increasing pay lines and a commitment to that. Uh, and to do so uh, across a, a balanced portfolio that uh, spans the spectrum of basic and translation, both early and late um, uh, clinical uh, and population science, as well as uh, more community-based uh, implementation science. Uh, perhaps the most sacrosanct part of this position uh, is the investments we make in the future uh, to train a, particularly a diverse uh, new generation of leaders uh, in science is a critical part uh, foundational core of what the Institute's mission is about. Uh, the last two relate to, uh, again, particular passions of mine uh, in which we've uh, tried to advance things and perspectives of supporting implementation science that empowers patients uh, and enables partners uh, to improve uh, the health of the nation and particularly uh, at the community level and I think particularly relevant uh, to a school of public health and public health practice. And then finally, to innovate an evidence-based elimination of health inequities uh, in the U.S. and around the world. And so it's with those sort of enduring principles that we've tried to, to, to guide um, the NHLBI uh, over these last uh, six years. This, this guidance has been uh, with the, the compass, if you will, uh, of a strategic planning process that uh, we initiated uh, that we call our uh, NHLBI strategic vision. Uh, in which uh, we set about to engage the community very broadly. We did it in a sort of uh, atypical fashion, actually sort of crowdsourced our strategic plan, uh, enabling uh, input uh, uh, for, from over 4,000 individuals uh, in every state of the country, um, uh, and uh, indeed 42 countries around the world participated in this process uh, of engagement and came up with 1,234 compelling questions and critical challenges uh, that we uh, uh, should tackle as an institute over the next five to 10 years. And our staff has boiled them down to these sort of four goals around human biology uh, and, and, and uh, uh, reducing human disease, advancing translation, and of course, uh, developing workforce uh, and resource uh, enablements. And these various eight uh, objectives uh, that we will be pursuing as part of the strategic vision. Uh, and uh, uh, as part of that, uh, clearly the bedrock is that uh, we believe that uh, the, the, the best ideas bubble up from you uh, in the investigator community as opposed to top down. Uh, and so uh, critical to that enduring principle, uh, we've tried to expand our portfolio of investigator initiated discovery science uh, as fundamental to our success. Uh, and so we've been fortunate with bipartisan support of, uh, of, of Congress uh, to be sure that we're making sure that uh, a substantial allocation goes to that pool, and that's resulted in increases in our R01 um, uh, pay line over the years, now up to 16th percentile this year, uh, with success rates in the mid-20s. And in particular, uh, a, a commitment to early stage investigators, where we give you a 10-point sort of handicap bonus uh, and have a pay line at 26th percentile, uh, for R01 submitted by early stage investigators with success rates uh, in the 30s. So uh, this is, a, I think, a, a good time uh, for you to be thinking about uh, biomedical career, studying heart, lung, blood, sleep science. Uh, and that's why we wanted to create uh, that foothold for you uh, with uh, uh, your first R01. Uh, as part of the pipeline of that, that workforce, I also wanted to uh, uh, make you aware of of efforts we're doing to nurture the next generation and really uh, bringing up that, that diversity uh, and uh, an inclusive next generation 
uh, of uh, scientific leaders. Uh, and we found that our, our K awardees are uh, at the forefront of the, the, the wave of, of next R01 awards. Uh, it's actually been a delight today. I've probably met uh, several uh, K awardees already. And uh, uh, indeed, I, I want you to be sure you're taking uh, advantage of the opportunities. Uh, some of these, uh, the, the programs we have uh, provide a bridge award of an R03 on top of a K. It's a limited competition, so you're not competing against all those established investigators is just for K awardees to get an RO3 to get you uh, some initial seed capital uh, to bridge and, and develop your own research program. Uh, again, we have a special R35 program that uh, awards the person more so than the project for emerging investigators. Uh, again, trying to uh, help those in mid-career and, and, and uh, uh, after their early stage award uh, and a variety of others, including an R01 uh, physician Scientist Research Award uh, for uh, ESIs uh, as well that uh, are in certain uh, areas uh, uh, that are underrepresented uh, in our portfolio. So we're making a lot of, of, of venues and opportunities to get young people started uh, in the Institute. So that's the uh, accountable stewardship. I hope the bottom line that you heard there is that we're trying to invest in you. Uh, you're the future. Uh, and uh, we're making substantial um, outlays to be sure that you have uh, a starting point uh, along the rung of your career ladder. Let me pivot uh, now to um, some of the, the challenges that we're facing uh, in our portfolio that spans the spectrum of heart, um, lung, and blood disorders. Uh, and in the interest of time, with all due apologies to all my uh, pulmonary colleagues, I'll probably highlight uh, today, in particular, um, our, our, our blood disease portfolio and cardiovascular, uh, in part related to uh, uh, the presence of Framingham here uh, at BU. But I haven't felt, uh, I haven't forgotten the lung. Uh, just, uh, uh, you can see there, <laughs> you can see there the, the homage uh, to some of the challenge we're having in asthma and health disparities. And so, rest assured, we have programmatic activity across all the dimensions. Uh, but uh, uh, with that, uh, I want to start with um, uh, sickle cell disease as uh, really a, uh, um, a exemplar of some of the challenges uh, in minority health that we face. So despite the fact that it was actually one of the first molecular disorders that was described over 70-some uh, years ago now, um, it's been a, a slow and painful process toward uh, having uh, people living with sickle cell uh, being able to have a normal life. Um, it certainly uh, advances have been made over the last uh, uh, 40 years or so uh, with uh, the advent of, of uh, anti-infectious sort of uh, interventions that's a major cause of early childhood mortality, penicillin, uh, vaccine prophylaxis, uh, et cetera. Uh, and transfusions as a means of extending uh, the, the lifespan from what was uh, um, a, a childhood death sentence uh, 50 years ago to one where uh, many are living uh, to middle age. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, we recognize that still um, we have a lot of unfinished business uh, in terms of addressing the concerns and challenges of this particular patient population. I'm sure is no stranger uh, to those uh, of you here at, uh, who uh, care uh, places like Boston City Hospital and, and, and others. Uh, we're committed uh, to a full court press uh, related to sickle cell. It's emblematic of where we're hitting it, it across the entire spectrum uh, of our portfolio, whether it's uh, basic science, early translation, uh, clinical trials, uh, uh, sort of population rare disease, special population cohort studies, uh, and uh, uh, indeed implementation science related to this fragmented uh, patient population. So it's a comprehensive uh, sickle cell uh, strategy uh, where we're hoping to unleash uh, new diagnostic therapeutics and indeed a cure uh, for sickle cell disease as part of this full court press. Uh, indeed, uh, it has a global dimension as well. Uh, so although there are about 100,000 uh, cases of, of uh, individuals with sickle cell disease in this country, 
Uh, there are actually 300,000 babies born each year with sickle cell disease. So although this is a major problem here in the U.S., um, it, it is really the, a lot of the global health burden is actually in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where, uh, again, uh, hundreds of thousands of children are born each, each year uh, with sickle cell disease uh, related to high prevalence, obviously, of trait uh, in that part uh, of the world. Uh, and so this is an area where uh, we want to uh, execute a, a program of implementation science where a lot of the things that we know work here uh, in terms of newborn screening and case identification, uh, as well as um, the uh, infectious disease uh, protections of penicillin prophylaxis, uh, pneumococcus vaccine, et cetera, are, are things that are, are just not executed. Uh, in uh, low and middle income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And so we've embarked uh, on uh, implementation science programs to sort of translate that to uh, cont contextual, country specific, uh, locally um, uh, derived and generated and driven uh, solutions that work uh, in that context um, and to try to adapt uh, some of those approaches. Uh, indeed, including uh, the feasibility of hydroxyurea therapy uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And some of you may have seen the recent New England Journal article documenting um, the, uh, uh, the feasibility of, of that model uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's one of the things we're working on uh, as part of our implementation science and global health agenda related to sickle cell uh, at a population scale. Um, domestically, though, uh, we're, we're trying to continue to move the needle uh, and where uh, we have those sort of palliative uh, sort of procedures that have extended life uh, but, but haven't really eliminated suffering. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that may involve actually trying to cure this first molecular disorder. Uh, and we're encouraged uh, that uh, over the last several years, um, the technologies have merged and uh, emerged and matured uh, to the point where it, it may even be feasible to talk about uh, curing sickle cell disease within the next five years. That's at least our bold vision uh, for it, leveraging um, what has been gained in terms of uh, gene addition uh, uh, therapies uh, uh, with viral vectors, as well as gene editing tools of CRISPR and talons and others that actually can correct uh, that, that uh, mutation that causes um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, disease, as well as strategies that use gene editing, for example, uh, to induce a hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin, uh, that tends to, to pr prevent sickling and, and engender a, a, a more benign course. So there are a number of strategies using gene transfer and gene editing that could be transformative uh, for these patients. Indeed, some of those trials are, are underway. Some of them have indeed been done at NIH in our intramural program. Uh, and uh, again, the patient's lives have been transformed and we've uh, uh, engaged a number of them. So we're very excited about the possibility of this, recognizing that it may uh, primarily affect um, hundreds now with this autologous uh, bone marrow transplant uh, related uh, protocol uh, and probably is not ready for prime time scale in places like uh, Ghana or Nigeria, but at least it's uh, created a new pathway for uh, those patients uh, in the U.S. who have uh, uh, relatively uh, limited options for, uh, again, cure. And this has been a collective effort. It really takes a, an ecosystem of innovation uh, to make something of, like this happen. Uh, clearly, patients uh, and patient engagement has to be at the center, uh, in particular because this has been a population that, quite frankly, has felt uh, rather marginalized uh, over the decades. Um, uh, and some of that, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, the medical systems uh, probably contributed to. Um, and uh, uh, a sense that uh, um, uh, this population uh, has built up a certain mistrust about the healthcare system in terms of how they're treated in emergency rooms uh, around this country. So the notion of bringing them into a clinical trial has some barriers. Uh, but again, we're, we're optimistic and. Uh, encouraged by our engagement efforts uh, that suggested perhaps uh, with this opportunity for cure, uh, again, that we can do this as a partnership uh, with patients uh, and advocacy groups. And it will involve academic institutions like this one, uh, as well as professional societies uh, uh, and uh, 
um, uh, coordination with the federal agencies for curative therapies in this, of this sort, with the FDA, CMS, uh, and uh, indeed pharmaceutical companies and biotech. So this is really going to be an ecosystem uh, in which everyone uh, uh, needs to lean in and participate, and probably no one entity, particularly in curing sickle cell, can, can do it in an isolation. Uh, so uh, we look forward to your uh, engagement and, and participation uh, in this partnership effort um, that uh, as is, uh, will have a number of different elements of patient engagement and communication, um, uh, an analysis of, of therapeutic strategies based on uh, what, what the best scientific uh, techniques may be uh, to deliver uh, sustainable cures, uh, elements of bio, uh, manufacturing, uh, informatics, data sharing, um, uh, assessments of clinical and economic uh, impact, uh, given, again, the tremendous resources uh, that are expended by the nation uh, in uh, this, this patient population and what a cure might actually be in the long term. And so there are a number of elements of this, uh, some of which uh, go from uh, basic science all the way to public policy uh, and, and public health impact, uh, even for a rare disease. And it could be a real exemplar uh, as a rare disease of how uh, this collective effort uh, could be uh, dramatic in its impact. So with that rare disease in mind, uh, let me pivot uh, to something more common. And uh, again, I feel uh, compelled uh, coming to Boston University uh, to uh, uh, give homage uh, to the Framingham Heart Study, uh, in which uh, uh, you have uh, tremendous leadership here, and Hassan and Amelia and, and others, uh, and uh, where it is uh, celebrating uh, its, its anniversary as well as the institutes of over 70 years now of pioneering um, uh, population science that's had public health impact. Uh, I don't think there's an exaggeration to say uh, what a tremendous uh, gift to this country and the world uh, the Framingham Heart Study has been uh, as a, um, and again, a great exemplar of the, the public health uh, and population science paradigm and its ability to transform uh, and guide uh, biomedical discovery at the bench, uh, as well as uh, uh, generate hypotheses for clinical trials uh, and have public health uh, impact uh, in its identification of the, of the risk factors, even coining the term risk factors, developing its mathematical analytics, if you will, of a multivariable risk score. Uh, all these things we owe uh, to the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, and in many ways, it's, it's a paradigm for the Institute uh, because it brings together um, how our portfolio elements uh, interdigitate uh, and, and actually synergize with each other uh, by identifying risk factors, uh, particularly high cholesterol, high blood pressure, et cetera, uh, that started to identify uh, potential mediators and targets like LDL cholesterol uh, and indeed predisposed to basic science uh, work and genetics uh, that Brown and Goldstein were able to pursue to understand all the pathways of metabolism uh, governing LDL uh, cholesterol levels, identification of MG-co-reductase, uh, and, and that being a, a drug target. Uh, and then part of this ecosystem of innovation um, being uh, a, a good target uh, for the private sector to commercialize uh, and then create a whole generation of drug statins that have transformed medicine uh, and that have been demonstrated uh, by clinical trials even up uh, to very recently. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then advancing public health and implementation science with um, the, the cessation of smoking, uh, elimination of policies of secondary smoke exposure, uh, as well as, uh, again, the cholesterol lowering uh, that has happened that has reduced cardiovascular uh, heart health. Uh, heart deaths, uh, and in many ways really set the stage for what we might call precision prevention and public health. Uh, and uh, this is a, a pathway and a paradigm uh, that I would hope that we can repeat and replicate. Uh, indeed, uh, some elements of it, like the discovery of PCSK9 in population studies and basic science and a target for therapeutics have again gone through that same loop and have been now shown to, again, reduce card cardiovascular uh, events. Uh, so we, we have a lot to learn from this paradigm that Framingham was critical 
in setting. Uh, and indeed, uh, is that paradigm of identifying risk uh, and the Institute uh, sponsoring not only uh, the move from observation to intervention uh, that then has impact uh, that we can hope to continue to recapitulate. And we're excited that uh, uh, one of the more recent uh, exemplars of that related to the high blood pressure as a risk factor was the SPRINT trial that you're all familiar with, showing that a more aggressive uh, blood pressure lowering target for, to 120 rather than 140 could reduce heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and, uh, uh, and most recently, uh, you probably saw the, the recent article in JAMA uh, suggesting that, that the group that also participated in the, the ancillary study of SPRINT MIND, uh, uh, which was looking at um, markers of cognitive impairment uh, and um, uh, brain MRIs of white uh, hyperintensities uh, was able to document that uh, in those patients followed up, uh, there was a reduction in the incidence of mild cognitive impairment, uh, combined uh, incidence of, of MCI and probable dementia, and uh, evidence that uh, the biomarker, if you will, the progression of white hyperintensity appeared to be, uh, that trajectory appeared to be slowed, uh, suggesting that we may have uh, a, a, um, a treatment at hand that not only reduces uh, cardiovascular events and is good for heart health, uh, but is also probably good for brain health as well, and is one of the, the, the more robust interventions we could do uh, to preserve cognitive function uh, over time. And so again, I consider this still part of the legacy uh, of uh, Framingham, which again is transforming medicine and having a dramatic effect on the health of our nation. So with all that, uh, we've, we've benefited from incredible reduction of coronary heart disease deaths in this country. Uh, and so we have a lot to, to uh, acclaim with great success, um, but we also uh, have some unfinished business. Um, not all the communities in this country have, have uh, uh, enjoyed the fruits of, of those investments and those discoveries. Uh, and uh, I don't think the NHLBI's mission is complete uh, until it affects the diversity of our country uh, and, and has a positive impact on all of our communities. Uh, and this is a, uh, a map uh, that shows uh, at a county level geographic disparities in cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see those sort of red zone there uh, that stretches down from almost tracing out um, at the Appalachian the Mountains and Ohio River Valley and Mississippi uh, Valley into the deep south of uh, West Virginia and Kentucky and Missouri and Oklahoma and Arkansas, Louisiana and Alabama uh, that continue to be hotbeds of, of cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, clearly that means that uh, we have work to do and that probably uh, that where, where you live and, and, and work and play uh, has an impact uh, uh, on uh, the outcomes uh, that you're likely uh, to suffer. Uh, and that's consistent uh, with a, a frame, uh, a social ecological frame, if you will, uh, that a lot of these health inequities uh, are complex, sort of hairy, multi-level uh, problems uh, in which uh, there are many elements and many, many dimensions uh, of which a key part is uh, the social determinants, the social environment, uh, the exposome, if you will, uh, in which you have an interaction of, of social uh, factors, racism, uh, segregation, uh, social isolation, uh, certain neighborhood features that are, uh, are adverse uh, to a healthy lifestyle um, that promote uh, a state of psychological and psych social psychological uh, stress, uh, promote sleep uh, disturbances, uh, and contribute uh, to physical inactivity uh, and, and dietary uh, uh, habits uh, that are unhealthful. All of these elements uh, are, are postulated to play a key role uh, in that map uh, in, in its geographic disparities. Uh, we're also intrigued by the notion that uh, there uh, may, appears to be this biosocial interface in which a lot of these exposures are able to get under the skin and start to influence uh, biological systems, uh, and there are biological systems that are literally poised to be at that environmental social interface with body systems, whether it's lining uh, your, your gut uh, microbiome, 
uh, or the immune system that's closely coupled to it, uh, or the ability to modify your DNA through epigenome, uh, reflective of some of those exposures, there are ways to modify biological systems as part of that interaction uh, that can be assayed in the transcriptome and proteome, et cetera, that are influenced by one's population history and genomic variation, all of which comes together to influence biological pathways that may predispose to cardiovascular complications. And so we're already seeing um, elements of that and how, again, that biosocial interface may be activated. And so uh, when we think about um, uh, local and social contextual factors, um, linking social determinants to biological systems um, uh, is one of the, I think, uh, emerging opportunities. We're very familiar with um, the, the, the disparities in access uh, to healthy diets and uh, food insecurities, food deserts. Uh, and uh, uh, if I, as an aside, I, I, I can still recall uh, that um, I, I didn't have many resources when I was a Harvard medical student. And so I used to live uh, in um, Dorchester, Roxbury area, because that was the only place I could afford the rent. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I always had to remember uh, when I was leaving the, the quad of, of the Harvard Medical School, uh, I don't know if it's still there, but there was a star market uh, down there around the, um, uh, it, uh, out the square or across the street from the old Sears. I guess none of that stuff exists anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I had to go to star market uh, because by the time I got home, there were, there, were no other, there were no other supermarkets close to where I lived in, in Roxbury, Dorchester. So that was, that was my last shot uh, before I left the quad. And so I don't, I don't know if, how much things have changed in the last uh, 25 years, uh, but, but I remember that as a Boston uh, context. Uh, and, and we appreciate that that exposure to fresh fruits and vegetables um, has um, biological consequence that part of what gives fruits and vegetables their color is the phytochemicals that are part of them uh, and that they, uh, um, one of my favorites, uh, is, is part of what gives red wine its, its color um, and, and hopefully there'll be enough of that uh, at dinner uh, later. Uh, uh, but, but we recognize that, that that's also feeding our, our gut um, micro, my, microbiota and that uh, we have three trillion organisms living on and around and inside us. And so what we eat influences what they eat uh, and what microbes emerge uh, and the balance of microbes in our system and how they metabolize what we give them to eat and what chemicals they then generate that are then absorbed in our body and modulate our immune system and our other biological functions. And so, um, indeed, there is this, this uh, interactive dance that we have between how we're feeding and controlling uh, these uh, coexisting organisms with us and how they influence our body. And it, there's a, a, a emerging and burgeoning evidence that uh, it affects uh, our immune systems, our vascular biology, our obesity, uh, and diabetes risk. And so the, they're clearly now being elucidated pathways uh, by which that social context and environment uh, starts to get under the skin and influence biological systems with consequence uh, on disease. And uh, certainly uh, we're seeing it in the cohort studies that, that the NHLBI funds. Um, this one just noting uh, cardia, looking at uh, racial differences and the growing trends in obesity, hypertension, and diabetes amongst this uh, uh, cohort that had started uh, uh, in their relatively early adulthood through middle age now, uh, in which um, we're seeing the impact of that risk and its dis disproportionate effect and burden among communities of color um, and how that's influencing those hot spots of disparity. Uh, notably uh, uh, in this, uh, is also that social dimension. Uh, Cardia also uh, made the observation uh, that the African Americans uh, who lived in uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, that were racially segregated and stayed within those racially segregated uh, areas tended to have uh, higher uh, blood pressure than those who went and transitioned from segregation to uh, a more uh, integrated 
uh, neighborhoods. And so, uh, again, suggesting that that context um, uh, and um, uh, ecological exposures, particularly early on, uh, may have consequences for health uh, that, uh, uh, again, have long-term consequences. It raises this notion that uh, if indeed uh, we may have an opportunity uh, with a systems approach, a multi-level systems approach to discovery and precision, precision prevention, uh, and indeed perhaps the preemption of chronic disease uh, that literally can connect from nucleotides uh, to neighborhoods. Uh, this more multi-level and, and inclusive uh, approach uh, starts to help us to uh, wrestle with all these dimensions uh, that we can not only interface with as um, uh, scientists and clinicians and public health practitioners, uh, where we are inclusive of the built environment, um, uh, personal behaviors of physical activity, nutrition, uh, but also bring in uh, the other elements and dimensions of access to, to care, uh, as well as the, the effects on the biological systems with these new uh, tools of omics, of the, uh, the genome and the proteome and the metabolome, uh, and, and really uh, create um, uh, the opportunity to learn uh, at a multi-level uh, how these systems work to, to promote health and disease. Uh, we now have uh, the capability of, of generating uh, uh, large amounts of data that, uh, uh, again, everything that's in our pockets here uh, with this computer uh, can measure uh, with my Apple Watch here. As it's told me, by the way, I've been sitting around in meetings too much today. Uh, and haven't gotten enough physical activity, uh, but can also check my sleep-wake cycle, uh, calculate the calories I need to burn, uh, and uh, uh, soon we'll be uh, getting better and better at measuring blood pressure. Certainly it's pretty good already at heart rate. Not bad at, at uh, detecting things like uh, arrhythmias and AFib. Still has a ways to go, but uh, the potentials are there. Uh, we're, again, just breathing into uh, the receiver, uh, people are starting to calculate FEV1 uh, and other elements uh, uh, by the tremor uh, in a voice or uh, in a hand uh, being able to say something about uh, a Parkinsonian uh, or by tracing uh, activity and movement um, about someone's depressive symptoms or, or their mental state, uh, let alone the ability to transmit information uh, that will remind me uh, about uh, my, my high blood pressure uh, pills that I have to take, uh, as well as uh, the appointment or coach me uh, on my physical activity. So we have new tools now of personal sensors and mHealth uh, that, again, have the potential uh, to, to have uh, national community level uh, participant generated um, uh, both functionality uh, and impact. Uh, and so uh, this is, I believe, a rich area and time uh, for us to pursue some things as a collective uh, in which um, uh, part of our strategic uh, vision uh, is this notion of precision prevention, precision medicine, and, and leveraging uh, the new tools of data science uh, to really, again, uh, advanced discoveries that have public health uh, impact. Uh, and the tools, we believe, uh, are coming in hand, uh, where we'll be able to identify uh, individuals, uh, particularly different uh, risk subsets, uh, and that are, are, are particularly um, uh, targeted uh, for certain types of interventions and perhaps certain uh, sorts of responses to those interventions. And part of our challenge at NHLBI and the NIH is to create uh, the, the learning health systems and, and community systems uh, and, and data systems and platforms uh, to, to, to uh, uh, both discover uh, and implement uh, this, this vision. Uh, part of that element uh, uh, includes the All of Us program that I believe uh, uh, there are people here at BU that are participant uh, in that process that we think uh, will be helpful uh, in advancing uh, this concept. At the NHLBI, uh, we've uh, uh, built on our legacy of, of community-based cohorts and other mechanisms to, 
to contribute to this in a way we think is very complementary uh, to the NIH-wide All of Us program uh, that leverages these the various diverse uh, communities that are within uh, our portfolio uh, and using the deep phenotyping, the longitudinal follow-up, uh, as well as new um, high-throughput technologies to, to characterize uh, pathways of, uh, that may be affected by exposures uh, or genetic heritage. Uh, and so this has been part of our top med program uh, that, uh, again, is, is using uh, these strategies. Uh, just as an update, uh, we've uh, embarked uh, on this program to create what we think is a, a fairly remarkable um, uh, resource uh, the, both in its diversity uh, as well in its characterization uh, as a genome phenome uh, resource that we think will be a, a great engine uh, for data science with public health impact. Uh, its population diversity is shown here. Uh, this uh, is intentional uh, in recognizing the sort of Eurocentric nature, quite frankly, of most genomic um, data sources that quite frankly, uh, have impaired our ability to use the full power of this tool, these tools and technologies to be applicable uh, to the diverse uh, country that we have. Uh, and so it's not until we uh, invest in um, these genomic resources uh, that reflects the diversity of our nation uh, that we'll get the full benefit for all communities. It's also um, uh, uh, not a matter just of PC uh, or uh, political correctness uh, uh, or morality even necessarily. Um, it's the scientifically smart thing to do uh, because uh, it's reflective of the diversity of the human family. Uh, and by understanding the diversity of the human family, particularly perhaps uh, the, 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 the oldest branch uh, and limb of that, that, that family, uh, with the greatest genomic diversity, uh, we're probably going to have more of an understanding of the critical variants that influence biology. Uh, and so therefore, expanding that diversity is going to give us so much more uh, scientific, um, biological and clinical impact uh, that will advance the field. And so uh, it's an imperative uh, scientifically and programmatically uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, because we're the NHOBI, uh, it has a broad uh, phenotype. Uh, there's my lung shout out again, uh, in which uh, uh, that's a substantial part of the phenotypes, asthma, COPD, uh, IPF, uh, as well as a number of cardiovascular and, and blood phenotypes uh, as well. Um, just to highlight just a couple of examples, uh, actually one came up today in one of the uh, investigators that I, I mentioned, uh, and that is um, uh, around some of the observations that are being made, and you have investigators, you have particularly great uh, Kea Wardy, uh, who's involved in, in top med, uh, and uh, um, there are certain discoveries that they couldn't have made until we scaled up uh, to really tens of thousands of participants, and it's enabling them to, to discover things like this paper. Uh, where they found a, uh, a set of, of mutant variants in the gene called Titan, huge gene, uh, that in which loss of function variants uh, appear to be uh, involved in early onset uh, atrial fibrillation. It's also notable that uh, variants in this gene also predispose to uh, early onset dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, suggesting that this basic loss of sarcomere function uh, may influence uh, fundamental developmental uh, pathways and structure of the heart uh, that might predispose to, to both those things. And clinicians in the audience recognize that sometimes uh, AFib may be a harbinger of, of heart failure, and other times heart failure may be a, uh, leading to, to AFib. And so it's intriguing that uh, this molecular um, um, uh, and, um, uh, change uh, in this gene uh, could uh, predispose to either of those uh, clinical endpoints. And so there's a lot of observations being made about uh, the mediators of and predispositions to AF that's telling us something about how the heart is formed and the pathways and molecular mediators of that process and how that might predispose with, with other clinical events toward that condition. Uh, another uh, intriguing area uh, in this space uh, is what's emerging about these, these complex traits and disorders in which we appreciate 
uh, that there are multiple inputs. Uh, they're polygenic by definition, that they're contributions from many uh, different loci, different pathways um, that are contributing to the phenotype. And uh, uh, recent advances in the way that that's uh, being analyzed is starting to uh, develop uh, tools and, and strategies to identify uh, subsets of uh, patients and people uh, that appear to have dramatic increases in risk, almost rivaling that of, of highly penetrant monogenic um, risk scores. Uh, and so uh, it's intriguing that you may be able to identify uh, a high risk tail of maybe 5% of individuals that you, know, you might not have picked up by a Framingham risk score that uh, might be predisposed to coronary disease or atrial fibrillation or diabetes or other conditions including uh, obesity. Uh, and so uh, by now using uh, some of this information, this may have again substantial public health, community health and clinical significance in a prevention and a precision prevention agenda uh, where we might be able to intercede earlier uh, with, um, uh, again, lifestyle modification and other sorts of interventions to prevent and preempt chronic disease. So we're very excited about some of these insights that are starting to emerge. And it really starts to set the stage for us to take a systems approach and a framework uh, for precision prevention uh, that harnesses these new technologies uh, to improve uh, public health incomes at, at a multi-level uh, kind of approach uh, whether it's at the level of the molecule uh, and reinforced uh, at the community level, the population, the public health practice level as well. Indeed, since we know that uh, although we've defined these genetic markers and polygenic risk score, um, in essence, they're telling us it takes multiple contributions to give you the phenotype. And, and yet DNA is not destiny either, uh, that these are, are predispositions, but they can be modified. Uh, by, again, that, that interaction with the environment and behaviors. Uh, and indeed, that's implicit in the data, uh, again, from our cohort studies, that uh, even those at high risk by basic of a genetic risk score, uh, that risk appears to be modified by those who've adopted uh, a healthier lifestyle. Uh, again, suggestive that, again, there's this interaction uh, between the two. Uh, and that gives us hope for pre precision prevention uh, where uh, interventions are likely to yield fruit. And so we're, we're hopeful that uh, we as uh, in the biomedical community, the public health community, uh, can start to, to move and bend uh, biomedicine uh, and public health as, as an information science that we can adapt uh, to some of these new tools of, of deep learning uh, and artificial intelligence toward this precision prevention future. Now, I'm old enough to know uh, what that car is uh, on the left. I don't see anybody. Is Senator in the audience? He's an old guy. Uh, you know what that car is? There you go. I knew somebody had a 56 Thunderbird, classic car, classic car. Uh, so so uh, that was, you know, one of the jewels of an automobile um, back in the middle of the last century. Uh, and uh, uh, again, a, a, an icon uh, of, of companies was Sears, transformed the, the, the 20th century of retail. Uh, and uh, probably the young people don't even know what that thing with the handle and the rotary dial is on the bottom. Um, it, it doesn't look anything like this, uh, but you know, there was a day when you, you had to go to a wall or, or a line in a wall to actually talk to somebody. And if you were away from the wall or away from the line, nobody answered the phone. Um, and, and they couldn't talk to you just because you happened to be giving a lecture at the moment. So that was then, uh, but now we actually have cars that can drive themselves. And, and we have entities like uh, retailers like Amazon. Uh, and it's, it's probably important for us, particularly those who are clinicians uh, like myself, that um, uh, we, we hope that we're not the seers of the 21st century, uh, which as many of you know is practically bankrupt, um, and that we, we, we need to adapt to be more like Amazon. Uh, I, I, 
I've shown this picture where it's a screenshot of me. You can probably sort of discern that it sort of says, Hi, Gary, on it. Uh, and it actually shows, uh, as you all know, uh, Amazon's looking at everything that you hover on, everything you click, certainly everything you buy. Um, it knows you know, where it shipped it to, so it knows my house, it knows my address, probably knows my mortgage. I uh, pay, pay with a credit card, so it knows my credit score, probably my whole history there. Um, and so it, there's not a lot probably Amazon doesn't know uh, about me. Uh, I think more than actually the NSA and the FBI. Um, and, and it can recommend, obviously, the books that I like to read. It picked out. I, I'm a biography buff. Uh, and so it, uh, this was a few years ago now that told me to buy the Jefferson um, biography. Uh, and indeed, I bought the Jefferson biography. So, so it knows me better than I know uh, myself. Uh, and, and it struck me, again, as a, as a clinician, um, that's something that clinicians are supposed to be able to do, right? That, that we should know enough about our patients uh, to, to have some sense of what their propensities, what their prognosis, what their future should, should be, and, and maybe even guide them toward the interventions that, that make sense uh, for them. Uh, and so if, if Amazon can do that by learning and using these systems and these data, shouldn't we be taking a hint uh, from that and perhaps adapting a little bit more of that approach? Uh, and so part of our uh, task, and I think hopefully our vision, is to start to create um, and envision this communal discovery space, this, this data sandbox. Um, in which uh, we hope to accelerate discovery and cures and preemptive therapies for chronic disease uh, in, in partnership with uh, entities like you. Everything is becoming more digital, uh, but not everything uh, has been digitized in the way that uh, it's findable and accessible and interoperable and reusable and uh, can be shared uh, readily, let alone where a machine can, can learn and train and see patterns that we can't see. And so that's, that's a transformation that we have to uh, embark on in how we interface uh, and, and work with and play with and experiment with data. Uh, and uh, part of, I think, our task as a partnership community is figuring out how to do that, how to play in the sandbox and share more effectively uh, toward that end. We hope that we can create a, a common space, um, maybe not dissimilar to the original Boston Commons that was downtown, where anybody could take their farm animals and have them graze. Uh, it wasn't anybody's particular part, you know, part of the, 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 the turf. Um, there wasn't a lot of jockeying around about authorship and the publication and who owned what IP. Uh, it was a common space uh, that had common utility. Uh, one might argue that the taxpayers funding the generation of that data uh, want a public good that benefits many and is democratized and open to many. Uh, that's a, a vision and a space that uh, we'd like to work with you to create that might have uh, a lot of the data of the exposome, uh, whether that's uh, geographic data or GIS data or elements of your, your, your social context and environment, uh, as well as what might be in your personal sensor uh, and wearable technology, uh, and, and do that in a way that can be linked to all those multi-layer omics that we described. Uh, this could be a, a means of, of, again, generating uh, the, the, a more robust uh, agenda for precision prevention uh, and public health. So I'll just conclude uh, with um, this uh, uh, imaginary scenario of precision prevention in the future uh, where you have this family shot. And you, you can see the, that, that's not actually a picture of me, um, uh, but you see a, a, an African-American male with glasses and, 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 and gray. Um, um, and, and he, uh, probably is at that age where he, we already know his polygenic risk score, uh, and he's already on treatment. Um, but the question is uh, his, his uh, adult children in their 40s who have a family. 
uh, and what do we do for them? Uh, so so, so uh, grandpa's already in the biomedical framework, uh, but we have an opportunity for precision uh, prevention for uh, uh, Michael and Carla uh, and as they are in their 40s with their family, uh, and they know they're at risk for hypertension, diabetes, uh, and strokes and heart attacks. What can we do as part of precision prevention and preemption with them? They know they have some issues with their, uh, their body fat index and uh, their sedentary lifestyles, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we can do a multi-level intervention. Is there a way that we as a community, we as a health system, uh, we as uh, collaborative partners can build a space, a learning communal health space uh, where um, a community might be able uh, to uh, uh, be engaged with uh, assessing risk, uh, whether it's their blood pressure, their BMI, uh, their cholesterol, their glucose, their hemoglobin A1C. All these are technologies that are uh, practically point of care uh, at this point uh, and use at, at very near future will be part of this personal sensor technology. I suspect Siri or Alexa will know all these numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, if we're able to then connect them uh, with the coaches uh, that can tell them uh, about how they may be able to, to modify that risk. And then again, use some of these technologies to track um, how they're doing uh, in their intake and activity uh, and their sleep-wake cycle about um, their progress along the way. Uh, and uh, they as a community may even be engaged in that process by walking together, by having you know, uh, competitions of steps uh, between them uh, in a way that enhances community health. Can we create that kind of common communal space, not only of, of data collection, sharing, uh, analysis, but also uh, one in which it promotes implementation towards precision prevention? Uh, that's a future that we'd love to engage uh, folks like you uh, in this uh, uh, ecosystem of innovation around precision prevention uh, in which all the, the players and partners in this circle we think can contribute uh, to uh, in, in enabling us to fulfill our mission to turn discovery science into the health of the nation. Thank you so much for your attention. That was uh, outstanding. Can, can you just uh, comment for a second? I, I know you didn't touch on it because of time. On um, NHLBI's intersection with global, with the rest of the world? Global? Yes. So um, if I hear the question right, it, it's, it's how we're uh, looking at global health in our portfolio. Um, and um, I suppose it has a number of dimensions to it, uh, but I, I would say that our particular focus is on um, basically low and middle income countries uh, in, uh, related to non-communicable disease uh, detection, treatment, control. Um, in particular, we're, we're uh, uh, in, impressed by WHO's uh, assessment of what the best values are uh, and hypertension, uh, if you were gonna pick you know, one thing that you're gonna do in non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries that would have long-term impact outside of all your infectious disease um, sort of interventions, that would probably be the one. If you, you kind of nailed me down the one and, uh, and where, um, again, it would be low and middle income countries. Uh, we're doing some of that in, um, in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and, and India, for example. Yeah, I thought it was uh, quite remarkable that you said that uh, some of the late work on genetic analysis shows uh, polygenic association for cardiovascular disease whose predictive value uh, measures up to some of the monogenic diseases. Do you know if, uh, if that 
particular association is well accepted now and if it's available commercially by any laboratory? Um, so uh, that's referencing, you know, a lot of work that's uh, burgeoning. I know, uh, say, Katharisen, who's, you know, down the block or whatever, uh, is, is a, a key leader in this space. Uh, is his uh, paper that uh, we're, we're sort of quasi uh, citing here. Uh, a number of them have, have come out uh, in this space. You know, there's still probably some, some uh, debate uh, about uh, the robustness and, and how many markers and uh, some of the assumptions related to it. Uh, so, but I think the, the, the concept, I think, is still uh, has some validity in ser terms of uh, developing um, an approach that uh, appreciates, again, the, com the, 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 the large number of, of inputs across many loci that may contribute to a complex trait like cardiovascular disease. And you saw a variety of other complex traits. So I, I think this is something you'll be hearing a lot more about, particularly now that um, Genomic resources are being created to scale. So literally now, you know, there's a recent publication of a meta-analysis of a million people uh, with uh, uh, blood pressure measures uh, and a genetic association. So, so now that you have those sort of scales, uh, people are now starting to be able to develop scores that are more robust. Probably, I don't know if they'll be ready for prime time for commercial until they get down to maybe a more manageable uh, set of markers, but I know there are companies that are already moving in that direction. So uh, uh, I'm sure very soon uh, somebody's going to start to put that out there. Uh, I think another question would be uh, as to whether uh, we're ready to do a trial based on it. So, so one of the attractive things to me is obviously the Framingham Risk Score, a big part of the score is age. And so you have to wait until you're whatever, 55, 60, to cross some threshold to then say, you ought to get a statin. W what if you had a uh, polygenic risk score that gave you that same sort of sense that you weren't intermediate, but maybe you're high risk? Should we be giving you uh, that statin at 45? Uh, and so I think those are the kinds of questions that this kind of thing starts to raise after a while. Dr. Gibbons, uh, great talk. Um, so two questions. The first is on sickle cell. Um, and so we think of sickle cell as almost be, should be treatable, right? I mean, you know, we, we can identify the gene and then, you know, it should be treatable. You mentioned something up front saying it's been very difficult for patients to be recruited in the trials because of experiences in emergency rooms. Is this been an, an, an ongoing issue, the ability to um, recruit African Americans into these studies? Um, so your comments on that? Yeah, so, so I guess a couple of things uh, uh, embedded there. Um, so as you pointed out, uh, as an early uh, molecular medicine uh, uh, sort of poster child, one may have thought that uh, a curative therapy would be uh, soon, but uh, clearly the technologies uh, to, to make those corrections and, uh, and, and be curative have, have been slow to, to come. Uh, uh, but now there are, uh, for example, uh, 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 integrating you know, lentiviruses that uh, appear to be much safer than earlier generations, ones that uh, are less prone to develop uh, malignancies and so forth, and so there's a momentum. Uh, in using uh, that technology, particularly for gene addition, that probably wasn't there before. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, uh, CRISPR-Cas is obviously you know, fairly new in that sense uh, of a therapeutic, uh, and again, a lot of advances being made in it. Still some safety issues to be addressed of off-target effects and other sorts of things, but, but again, a lot of rapid progress to suggest that that may indeed be feasible. Uh, and indeed, uh, trials are underway, certainly in thalassemia, the, that's happening. Uh, and uh, uh, again, patients' uh, trials are being launched anyway uh, in, in uh, sickle cell, at least uh, I think one uh, just outside uh, the U.S. So, so we're really on the cusp uh, of this. Obviously, we do have to demonstrate safety uh, as foremost uh, in doing this. Uh, I, I mentioned that it's not that it's... Um, 
impossible to, to uh, have African Americans participate in trials. We obviously do. We have Jackson Heart Study and others uh, studies. I just mentioned Sprint. Sprint over oversampled and overrepresented African Americans in that 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 uh, hypertension trial. It can be done. It just has to be uh, very intentional, uh, and and the outreach has to be tailored um, to 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 make that happen. Uh, I guess my point there with sickle cell was um, we're still asking people to take an unknown therapy uh, to have uh, engineered into your stem cells or your bone marrow a lentivirus, something that's actually a, a relative of, of HIV virus. Um, and we're talking about manipulating your genome in which there uh, may be, again, effects on other parts of your genome. Uh, and we may not know the effects of those for 5, 10, 15 years. In fact, the IND from FDA would want us to monitor them for the 15 years. So just like any research participant, there's risk and benefit. Um, so, uh, and uh, I think those are the kind of dialogues you want to have, but you want to do that in a context of respect and trust. And so trust is earned. And, and so that's where we wanted to make uh, 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 that patient population partners. So in, indeed, in fact, uh, unprecedented, we're, we're having uh, patients uh, represented on the executive committee for the study. Uh, the, the, the patient groups that were part of the strategic planning of the whole initiative, they're still involved in engagement of it. And so all along the way, uh, we've committed uh, to doing this uh, with them as partners. So why I bring that up is specifically about HEFPEF, so heart failure preserved ejection fraction, which is obviously at the forefront of part of NHLBI's you know, uh, research missions. So we've participated in some new HEFF studies, and we've been able to recruit four out of five initial patients have been African Americans, and people have signed on. And as you pointed out right up front, it's really the dialogue that you have with the patients and this uh, bi-directional relationship, so. Yeah, no, so it's a great point, and it, it, something I've had some uh, personal experience with. I think uh, that is true. There's Tuskegee and all those sorts of things, but as you, you highlight, um, you know, I think uh, it's been my experience that uh, that patient population recognizes, particularly if their sister or their brother or their mother or their daughter has that disorder, and we don't know exactly how to treat that particular person, and we say in order to treat you better and, and those uh, related to you, your neighbors, we need you to be part of participating in these studies about you and about the disease um, in a benefit to people in your community who look like you, uh, I, I think they start to understand that there's not only that, that potential uh, personal benefit, but they, they get the social beneficence to their community and their loved ones, just like anybody else who, who, who sacrifices to be in a research protocol. So in that sense, uh, I think that's the leveler. But that, that interaction uh, of mutual respect and trust has got to be there. So great point. Okay, I can't really see anybody out there, so you have to shout out. Okay, one more question. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I noticed, so in the, in the first half of your talk, you talked a lot about these social determinants of disease, and then in the second half, you focus a lot about the, these omics and these new technologies. Um, are there programs in place to ensure that the disparities that you discussed in the first half don't, aren't extended by these, you know, these new technologies, which of course, of course will be costly? and. Just uh, one of your comments on that. No, it's a, it's a superb point. Um, and I think that's something that uh, we need to be very vigilant uh, about. Um, hopefully you got the sense that just because we were talking about you know, DNA molecules that uh, we hadn't eliminated the, the, the ecological model, that again, uh, we see the, these things as integrative uh, and interacting and dynamic. Uh, and so uh, uh, I tend not to think of it as either or. It's both nature and nurture uh, interacting. Uh, and I, I would hope that we actually, in that communal space, have uh, disciplines and perspectives, uh, both of those interacting and talking to each other uh, as, as part of that. Uh, I think that may also help uh, uh, ensure that those, those uh, disconnects don't go uh, with the disparities. You also probably heard me talk about shifting the nature of the resource. And so, quite frankly, the, the resource has to change in being more diverse in order to be most, most helpful. 
Uh, and then, and finally, I, I would say that for certain technologies, uh, and this is even true in our global health realm, uh, it may be a leapfrog to move to uh, a mobile technology as compared to uh, tracking uh, LMICs through the path we've taken uh, for data collection and, and, and uh, communication. And so, so some of the technology uh, we think actually may help us uh, in, in uh, bridging uh, some of those inequities in some ways. Please join me, thank you. All right, thank you.